Right. Okay, so we now have um, a bit of time for a Q&A session with the panel, so our four speakers. Um, we've got a good number of questions come in, so some good ones for you to discuss before we then move on to our final presentation um, of the afternoon. Um, so hopefully you'll all start unmuting yourselves rather than just leave me hanging with questions out here that nobody wants to answer. The first one that's come in, um, I think, comes back right from our first presentation, so probably directed to Mark, but I'm sure others will have a view as well, uh, in terms of how decommissioning must be included in the whole of this digital twin system. So thoughts on how that comes into this process rather than perhaps building new stuff? Yeah, I, I think it's a really important point. Uh, I, I think what we need to do is look at um, the whole life cycle of assets. So, so definitely including decommissioning. Um, I mean, what I'm kind of hoping as well is that as an industry, we, we can move beyond the, the single use of, of materials. So, so not just kind of see decommissioning as the, the end of an asset and it gets thrown in, in a hole in the ground somewhere. But it, it becomes the beginning of future use of the materials in future assets. Um, yeah, that, that's clearly where the circular economy type thinking comes into this. So, so I, I would kind of really agree with the thrust of the question that um, the, the end of life part of this needs to be built into the picture. So I, I totally agree with that. Uh, I, I just think that end of life shouldn't actually be end of life. It should come back again. Um, and then the other thing I'd say to this is that I think it's really important for us to make a distinction between the system processes which have to go on forever. Um, I, I introduced that kind of the, the system that serves society and as long as we want society to exist then that system has to be serving it. So you know, we need the system to keep working for as long as we want society, i.e. forever. Um, and and that, those kind of forever processes uh, are different from a life cycle. Uh, and so I think we need to see assets in that context uh, and we can have many assets through the, uh, the kind of the ongoing life of the system. Uh, and then I think we can see the asset life cycles um, in that context. It means that we can see those as interventions on the system to keep the system going and to make the system better and better rather than just focusing on an individual project, uh, which, which, let's face it, is not an end in itself. You know, project really is about making the system work better to serve society better. So, so let's see that bigger picture. Uh, and in that bigger picture, we can see the, uh, the end of life as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, anybody else want to add anything to that? Yeah, I'll jump in. I think when we're starting to talk about platform design and the way we are, where we're looking at kits of parts for buildings, if we have this methodology for creating a building from a kit of parts and we've modelled it and we've named it and we've handed that to the client in a format that isn't going to decay and get, get lost in time, we know what we've got when we come to decommission a building. What can we take apart? What can we reuse? And there may not be a, a need to change its, its name and its, its model form. We should be able to not just reuse the bits of the building. Hopefully we can use re, reuse bits of the data and bits of the model and transition that um, to other projects and other buildings. But that platform methodology that starts to emerge is, is very important to that because a lot of the time when we're designing bespoke buildings, the outcome of when we decommission that building, a lot of the things that we have to take out of that uh, in that demolition process, they are essentially going to waste. So hopefully we can we can move in that direction. Thank you very much, John. Okay, um, next question is about structured data um, and kind of paraphrasing what the questioner has put. Um, how much do you think this whole project is going to, sort of the whole project of digital twins or even the national digital twin is going to be constrained or stymied by a lack of structured data? I think initially, sorry, it's Vicky here. Um, Go on, Vicky. I think, um, Initially, it, it will be um, as the same as um, any new initiative or new use for a type of data or, or, or data set. Um, we'll have to figure out what's usable and what's not. Um, but I think 
there is due to be a massive influx in, in the call for structured data over the next um, 12 to 18 months, not just because of um, people requesting and requiring digital twins, but also because of the golden thread um, data requirements that are going to be uh, included in the in the building safety bill, um, hopefully towards the end of this year or the beginning of next year, which um, basically, I think it was mentioned in, in someone's presentation earlier, um, has a requirement for information to be um, managed digitally. Uh, basically, you need to know what decisions were made about all of your assets, um, why they were made, and you need a log of that information. And there's clear levels of responsibility um, within that chain. So, yeah, and initially, it will be it will be difficult, but I think we have a lot more pushing this time than we have previously um, with things like the the BIM mandate. There are more. It's, it's an issue around health and safety this time, um, and there's there's legislation involved. So I think we'll just learn very quickly. Um, I can just chip in a little bit. I, I think it um, probably depends on what information you're talking about. So you're know, building on what, what Vicky's just said. Once it becomes regulatory or you know legislative that you have to provide something in a certain way. You know, you, what you, you're probably going to start seeing almost like a scalpel approach to value data at scale. So the, there might be a lot of information that we can't use, but there's, the, you know, there are there are bits of information that are going to become, you know, not mandated but regulatory, um, which, you know, it's essentially um, are going to give us that sort of really deep understanding of of one aspect of the information that we've got. Um, I, I, I do have another, another view on this, which is, you know, once you start really ramping stuff up at, at scale, you know, you, you, you're kind of moving away from someone filling a spreadsheet in or the equivalent of, you know, more towards somebody, you know, coding HTML. Um, and, you know, if you can get the internet to work, then surely we can all understand how to translate and, and, and aggregate information from, you know, the most important aspects of the data that we need um, as a as a society or as an industry. So I, I, my view is it's not going to be a blanket answer. I think there's going to be areas of, of real progress. Yeah, yeah, I think there's going to be an, an element of me too creeping in when somebody's got a smarter building than somebody else and they're getting benefits that you're not getting as a, as a blue chip client and you've been given a, a data set that isn't that great. You're going to do what has always been done in the industry. It's not right, and it's it's not what we should be doing. But they'll resurvey it. But rather than just resurveying it as a measured survey, it'll be resurveyed for data to support these new shiny technologies that they want to support with their building. So we'll have a period where bad data is delivered, and we mop up after it. But hopefully, we'll, we'll move more towards the um, structured data in time, as George described. Yeah, could I maybe chip in on, on this as well? Because I, I think it, this is a really important question. Uh, and uh, I think when when we start talking about the structured data um, and kind of data formats and schemas and this, this kind of stuff, um, it's very easy to think that you know, we get into some very kind of nitpicking rules to follow. Um, and uh, people get scared that having one approach to that will constrain everybody. Um, and I guess the point that I would want to make in this is, is the thing about it not being constraining uh, and actually being a, a bigger issue that needs to be solved. So I don't think it's just about having um, data formats that work or being able to structure data according to particular schemas. There's something at a higher level further up the semantic layer cake, if I can call it that, um, that needs to be put in place that enables digital twins to talk to each other. Uh, and, and kind of continuing with that uh, analogy of, of talking, uh, it's not just having the words, which, are, which is the kind of the data bit, uh, but it's also knowing the structure of the sentences to enable twins to talk to each other. Uh, and so we need rules and axioms for that language. Uh, and that's where we need to have these higher level uh, rules, which are to do with the upper ontology and to do with taxonomies. Uh, and so when earlier on I talked about um, the semantic solution that we imagined for the National Digital Twin, 
it's really at that level that we think we need to create consistency uh, and that then means that at those lower levels uh, you can facilitate mapping from one to another so we don't have to make the whole world look exactly the same but we do need to enable the the, the language to be spoken uh, and so um, I think that most people will not want to hear about uh, upper ontologies and whether it's 3D or 4D. And there's all sorts of really kind of complex philosophical stuff that goes on up there, which I have to say, I don't understand myself. Um, but somebody has to understand that and somebody has to work it out in a way that, that works for us as a nation. And then kind of down at our level, um, once we've got that in place, then we can speak the language which enables twins to talk to each other. Uh, and, and so I, I think that we do need to see beyond just data format and structured data and see that actually there's a, a kind of a greater lining up uh, to facilitate semantic precision. And, and I think uh, you know, what we're aiming for here, you know, the, the way we can get twins to talk to each other and to speak the same language uh, is to drive for semantic precision. And without that, we'll always have friction in the system. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, next question, um, which I think is obviously is is very different now, but still quite relevant in all of these discussions, is um, what do we do with the legacy building stock? Um, if we are moving towards digital twins, um, and I'm sure it's a quote I've heard from you actually, Mark, that we only build, I can't remember if it was 4% or 0.4% of our infrastructure network every year, that actually most of the digital twins have got to deal with existing assets. How do we approach this? So shall I have a quick a quick go at that? I'll, yeah, I'll try not. We'll let everybody have a go at this one. I think they all need to understand this one. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try uh, try not to get so bogged down as I did in that last one. Um, so yeah, I think that that the legacy stock is hugely important, and in fact, even calling it legacy stock makes it sound like it's a problem. Uh, I, I think actually this is an opportunity because um, we do have an immense amount of value in our existing infrastructure and, and the numbers that I'd use is we've got the 99.5% of infrastructure already and then each year we add 0.5% to it. So if we're, if we're going to get the kind of value that we've been talking about in all these presentations, uh, then we really do need to exist, uh, sorry, address existing infrastructure as well. Um, but what I think that doesn't mean is that we have to go out and get all the possible data of all the possible assets. Uh, we should be driven by purpose. It's this thing which I think has come out really clearly and really well from all of the speakers today is that, that digital twins are driven by purpose. And if we know what that purpose is, uh, then we can work back from that to work out which data we need to achieve that purpose. Uh, and, and so that means we don't have to get all data of everything. So it, it stops being such a such a headache and starts being an opportunity. Thank you. The rest of the panel, I'm going to throw this question to all of you to answer, I've decided. <laughs> I'll, uh, I, I can add a little bit. Oh, sorry, go on. Please. Oh no, I was just going to say, um, in, in light of um, health and safety um, and uh, the, the Hackett report and the requirements from there and stuff like that, there are there are things that we need to know about existing assets, regardless of, of whether it's in the context of a digital twin or not. Um, and a digital twin would would be a nice frame to hold that information in. Um, and so, yeah, exactly. I just mirror what what Mark said there, which is. Um, we don't have to have all of the information about all of the assets, but there are some things that actually it's probably quite a travesty that we don't know at the moment about some of the buildings that exist, especially around things about, especially around areas such as flammable material and um, and and such. No, cool. very good points, Vicky. Um, you're absolutely right there. Um, John, you were going to chip in as well. I heard. I think it was George, but I can go first if, oh, you, go if you so wish, Duncan. Go on, George. Yeah, while you've got I, I the think, microphone. Well, 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 whilst we're talking about existing buildings, well, we don't need everything. It, it, we, we need to take a really almost a software approach, almost minim, minimal viable product. When we've got legacy stock and we're talking about, I, I don't mean the safety aspect that Vicky brought up, we need to nail that. But in terms of what can we connect to things, 
to do smart things with and develop insight. That asset list the things you own within your building, which ones are smart, which ones can actually be connected to stuff. It's going to be a relatively small list. So if we're looking for smart devices that can give us good data from existing buildings, there's, there's many projects that people can do about assets and start connecting. Oh, lost John, I think. Go on, George, you take over. We'll just give up on you. You need to look at it. Oh, no. <laughs> we lost uh, you for sorry, a second. Sorry, did John. I? You lost me yeah. for a second. Yeah, so it, it, it's about understanding what insight you want to gain, things that you have repetitive tasks on that you waste loads of loads of time and effort and money on. If, the, if it is a connected device, Go and find out about it, give it a unique name, connect it to your data set and start getting some insight. Just, just small projects, you don't have to do it all at once. They can be really valuable and start creating efficiencies and just build from there. Brilliant. Thank you very much, John. And George, sorry, yes, back to you then. Yeah, I mean, I think it was one of my three key points, I think, um, which was, uh, you know, form follows function. Um, which follows outcomes, which follows purpose. So, you know, to, it's you, it's a burden to have all of the information about everything just in case you need it. It becomes an enormous task to manage and maintain these things. And if you don't do that, people lose confidence in the information and ultimately systems don't get used. Um, I think my, uh, I, well, I've got a couple of opinions on this. I mean, yeah, first of all, it's understanding the criticality and value of the data. And if it is critical and valuable, um, particularly in infrastructure, it will already exist. So a lot of the times it will be like, you know, in incorporating almost like BMS data and BACnet stuff, you know, alongside a transition plan for IIoT or, or, or something like that. There's a there's an approach there. But then if you actually look at more sort of traditional systems that, you know, it isn't worth, you know, and I'm not talking about just having the legacy data here as well. I'm talking about making, you know, getting live data and, and actuators on, on, on old and, and legacy assets. There's some really interesting things that the people do now in, in the marketplace. I mean, I was looking at something with Fujitsu recently. Um, they have a, a digital ear concept, which is uh, essentially uh, audio, just the, you know, you, you, you plonk the microphone here, there and everywhere. And uh, it, can, it can do things like, you know, if, if you do have something that tracks um, maintenance, and if you are aware that let's say a pump uh, is, is, is died, or is severely damaged. Um, the, you know there are like there are retrofit solutions out there now that can start, you know, listening to what noises it made on the run up to that, and then using a, a bit of simple machine learning to listen to the other pumps. And, and anytime one of those does that, you you replace it and update it. So it's not so I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about the big audit and, and understanding the information that you've got there, but having assets and um, and, and, and objects, I'll, I'll call them that have got the functionality to produce information doesn't necessarily mean an overhaul of the stock itself. Um, there are things that you can do to retrofit that. Um, we've got a big initiative in London at the minute looking at this, um, where we, you know, we're trying to understand it from an energy and sustainability perspective. So, uh, you know, again, just I think it's a scalpel approach. It's understanding what's important and where the value is. Uh, and, and nine times out of 10, you'll probably already have that in some way, shape or form, and it'll be a transition plan from what you've got to, to what you need um, long term, I think. Brilliant. Thank you very much, George. So with a cheesy link of one form of listening to another, um, final question for the afternoon, although I know there are other questions people have asked and we can capture all of these from the webinar and we'll be sharing them with the speakers to uh, create probably a bit of a blog piece out of it. So don't worry if you haven't had your question asked now. But yes, my cheesy link, um, security privacy, so another form of looking perhaps, is a key concern to my understanding. Is there any protocols or standards to ensure that security or data protection is particularly fit for purpose for digital twins? Any thoughts, folks? Shall I kick uh, off on was, that again? Yeah, I was looking to you, towards you on that one, Mark. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll just start the ball rolling on it uh, to say that this is an absolutely key subject. Uh, the questioner was was totally right to to bring it up, uh, and we have to build in security from from the very foundation upwards 
you know, we, we can't leave it until later on and think, oh, we'll slap it on as, a, as an afterthought. So I, I think um, in all the work to do with digital twins, we, we need to be security minded. Uh, and that doesn't mean that we don't do digital twins because we're scared that somebody might get access to it. What it means is that, that we, we do it with security in mind uh, and make them secure. Uh, so, so I, th I think that, that that's kind of completely non-negotiable. And actually, within the, um, the Gemini principles, we saw security um, as being one of the key foundations of, of trust, you know, purpose, trust, function. Uh, and we, we think that digital twins won't be trusted unless they are secure. So, so um, it's right at the centre of the Gemini principles, and it's the foundation of, of building digital twins. Um, and so, you know, just just to let you know, within the National Digital Twin Programme, uh, we're working very closely with the Centre for Protection of Natural Infrastructure, uh, so that so that right from the beginning, uh, the programme is security minded. Uh, so, so hopefully that's an, that's enough to kind of start the ball rolling. Is to say this is a massively important question, uh, but but that's that's why we need to build it in from the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, the people we're working with in in this arena, and as I said, it's prototype stuff, and we're doing some really interesting things with people. The security is coming up first, and right now it's it's costly and it's difficult to get around. But we're finding ways around taking Glider BIM off off the public internet and things like that. It, it's not what we want to be doing in the future. So we're, we're looking to um, CDBB to try and crack this in a more simple way. And we're, we're, we're watching with a bit of breath to see what they come up with. Um, I'll, I can, can I just chip in a little bit? Um, of course. But, you know, just to directly respond to that, it's probably worth looking at PAS 185 and 186. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, you've got the um, ISO 19650 PAR 5 standards, which are um, you know, there or thereabouts. The, I mean, the, the big thing for, for me with, with anything to do with this digital twin is there's two sides of this stuff. You've got your uh, physical security, you know, counter eavesdropping, etc. And then you've got your information security, which is kind of like the cyber physical side of it. Um, but there, there's, there's many, many layers to this once you start looking at digital twins and, and in, integrating data with uh, communities as well. So, you know, the I, I guess the five key points are, you know, what does what the ownership and segregation of data look like? How can you manage a large interconnected system with redacted information and, and make sure people have got access to valuable information but not access to sens sensitive information? There's a huge amount of work that CPNI have done around this, um, and, uh, and it's you know it, it inherently needs to be built into everything that we do, not just digital twins, but um, you know the, the the whole BIM process and project delivery generally. Um, I can tell you some um, scary stories. Uh, the you know the second one is actually just looking at um, hybrids of um, the, the cloud, physical, uh, and um, and other types of storage, and this is particularly um, interesting at the moment. We we have an entire industry um, that is working from home at the minute, or largely working from home. So most of the um, organisations, as well as clients, um, have decentralised security now. Um, so they the security is only as good as the home router, essentially. And um, so there's a you know. That's going to continue, and the, the trends that are going on, at the, you know, that we're anticipating in the UK is that that will become more and more important to deal with. Um, and then you've got other layers on top of that, such as GDPR and uh, things like, you know, exploiting things like digital twins and, and BIM models to understand things like cable security and um, vulnerabilities to eavesdropping and uh, terror threats. You know, there's, a, there's an enormous amount of um, effort that's gone into this. And I think as Mark attested to there, that it's one of the core fundamental principles of, or, or should be, of, of any type of programme delivery at the minute, because um, it's such a, an enormous risk um, to, the, uh, to the economy and the businesses that we work with, I think. 